Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining us with the, uh, the first uh, seminar in our series titled uh, Data-Driven Methods in Science and Engineering. This is a seminar hosted by the University of Washington. And uh, I realized that I said good morning, but the real beauty of this being uh, virtual is that for people around the world, this is not the morning necessarily. So maybe something good has come out, come out of this pandemic, at least science-wise. Uh, so I would like to begin by pointing out that it's taken a lot of work to put this seminar together. So uh, my name is Jason Bramager. I am one of the co-organizers for this seminar. There is also uh, Jordan Schneider, uh, Joseph uh, Bakarji, and Henning Lang. So we are all postdocs uh, here at the University of Washington working with uh, Nathan Coots and Stephen Brunton, who are also helping to organize this seminar. So we want to emphasize to you that this, this seminar takes place bi-weekly. So every two weeks, we will feature uh, people who are just really, really pushing the boundaries of data-driven science uh, as it applies to science and engineering. And if you want to stay up to date, please join our mailing list. Uh, so I assume that most people are already on it. But if you're joining us today uh, and haven't signed up for that mailing list, please make sure to do so in the future. Now. With that being said, I am extremely excited to present to you our speaker today. So our speaker is uh, Dr. George Karnadakis. So Dr. Karnadakis received his SM and PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he was appointed lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT in 1987, and subsequently he joined the Center for Turbulence Research at Stanford and NASA Ames. He joined Princeton University as an assistant professor in the Department of Me Mechanical Engineering and Aerospace Engineering and as an associate faculty in the Program of Applied and Computational Mathematics. He was a visiting professor at Caltech in 93 in the Aeronautics Department and joined Brown University as an associate professor, professor of Applied Mathematics in the Center for Fluid Mechanics in 94. After becoming a full professor in 96, he continues to be a visiting professor and senior lecturer of ocean and mechanical engineering at MIT. He is an AAAS fellow, uh, a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, a fellow for the American Physical Society, a fellow for uh, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He received the Alexander von Humboldt Award in 2007, the Ralph E. Kleinman Award from Siam in 2015, the J. Tinsley Oden Medal in 2013, and the CFD Award in 2007 by the U.S. Association of Computational Mathematics, uh, Mechanics. Sorry. So today, Dr. Karnadakis is going to tell us uh, about uh, his, his recent work, which he has titled it from uh, PINNS to deep one nets, approximating functions, functionals, and operators using deep neural networks for diverse applications. So Dr. Karnadakis, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jason. Thanks for this invitation. Um, this uh, series is, uh, uh, is really very meaningful to me because um, uh, I, uh, as you know, I'm interested in applications. I'm interested in deriving algorithms that work. For, for real problems, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk with you today. Um, first of all, let me ask if you can see my screen. Yep. <clears throat> and um, so, sorry. I can do this Oops. here, the slide show here. And <clears throat> you can also see the cup of coffee brewing. Yes, Jason? Yep, yep, we can see it. Okay. <laughs> All right, I just want to make sure. That, uh, thank you very much uh, again. Uh, so uh, I know it's early there in Seattle, so I wanted to start with this uh, cup of coffee. Uh, what you see here is um, uh, some slim video over a um, espresso cup uh, and I want to show you some results of how we can extract from that uh, from the, from those data just uh, gradients actually 3d 
um, experiment that uh, people of La Vision, a, a German company, uh, did for us uh, so that we could uh, quantify the velocity and pressure field of, um, of this flow, which is, I, I know very much a, a lot about it because I, I, I drink espresso many times uh, during the day. So I, I will leave those results uh, for, uh, uh, towards the end. I'll talk about that. But uh, uh, first, by the way of uh, introduction and, and outline, I will give you a glossary of um, terms that I will be using. PIN is a physics-informed neural network, which I will uh, talk about first. Then I will talk about um, uh, uh, neural networks for functional approximation, DeepFNet. The neural network for operator approximation we will call DeepOnet. And a sweet, good, effective framework for putting together um, uh, building blocks of deep nets for plug and play mode for modeling multi scale and multi physics problems. We'll call that deep MNM net. So I will, I will, hopefully, I will have time to talk about all this. So uh, I, I want to make clear what I am aiming at here. I'm, I'm aiming on solving real world problems uh, where we know some of the physics and we have some data. The data may not necessarily be what the data we have. It could be data on uh, inside the domain. So I may not have boundary conditions. I may not have initial conditions, but I, I may have some data. Uh, the, it, it could be that we don't know some of the physics because the physics is very complex. Imagine, for example, a coagulation cascade in a biological system or a cascade of reactions in a, in a complex combustion system. We never know exactly this, this um, um, that part of the physics, at the multi-rate uh, physics, for example, or in geophysical turbulence, uh, we may know the physics, but we cannot really resolve it at the scale at uh, be below a, a subgrid, even with exaflop computers. So, so this middle picture is what I'm aiming at, uh, where we know some of the physics, we can describe some of the physics, but then we use the data to improvise for, for closure of what we're missing or what we're trying to discover. Uh, the old paradigm is we know precisely the physics, especially in applied mathematics. We know everything, and we just want to solve to, 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 to come up with fast algorithms. And then on the other extreme, we have no physics at all uh, and just data. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this middle um, box here. So I'm going to show you three uh, theorems today. I'll start with the, the simplest one, which talks about universal approximation of functions, a Seibenko theorem. Uh, George I. Penko developed this when he was an assistant professor here at Tufts University, not from far from where I live. And basically it says that you can uh, have a single hidden layer, as I show here, and that they can approximate arbitrarily close. Uh, the, um, the kind of, the, uh, the, uh, any, any function. So, so the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the basis here is a nonlinear basis. That's different from what we know from Fourier's expansions, uh, finite elements, and so on. So uh, I would like to contrast that later. Uh, sigma here is the activation function, uh, which should be a non-polynomial uh, function. I will, active, I will uh, contrast that later with uh, other theorems. Now, if we have a lot of data, we can learn any function. For example, here, I have this function, which is discontinuous, has high frequency, has low frequency. But I pretend, and I also show on the right, it's Fourier spectrum. Now, it's interesting to sort of go through the, or take an X-ray of the neural network and see it. it's a deep neural network with not so deep to just two layers. But what you see here is happening. Let me just play this again. Uh, the approximation, which is by red, the approximation of neural network, captures the discontinuity first, then hierarchically goes from the low frequencies to the high frequencies. And correspondingly, you can see the Fourier spectrum here on the right. You see the frequency spectrum here, the high frequency, the low frequencies, and then you see the high frequency, which has to do with the adjustment of adaptively capturing the shock. So when we have lots of data, uh, neural networks and deep neural networks could be very, very expressive, expressive and uh, therefore um, uh, uh, it's a very good way um, uh, to approximate um, even nonlinear discontinuous functions. And there is good theory for it already. Now, of course, the question, and we know that in science and engineering, we never have enough data. For example, let's take this signal here I'm trying to resolve. I have some data, the red points. Uh, black is the exact uh, signal I want to reconstruct. 
let's say, uh, signal versus time or y versus x and so on. But I don't have enough data. So how could you reconstruct this? How you can discover this, this fu function, uh, this solution? You cannot. You just don't have enough data. But somehow somebody will give you data which be of different fidelity. So here on the right, I show you some data that you may get if you're lucky. Now this data is in blue and they show that, in fact, it's, it's, it's a little tricky data uh, because some of the data you can see help you a lot, but every other period they try to, on purpose or not, they try to pull you away from the, from the ground truth. So this sort of adversarial data. So you have this data. Uh, so if, if, you, if you try to correlate this blue data with the red data, you will see that's a very strange correlation, a nonlinear correlation. In fact, this is an anti-correlation. So standard techniques from autoregressive auto reg uh, auto methods would not work here. Uh, so you have to do something uh, more sophisticated than that. So uh, I want to use this data. I want to use a good part of this data. So we put together a multi-fidelity physics informed neural network to mimic what geophysicists do in co rigging And that is, you can use the low fidelity data to uplift them to high fidelity data with a bias. But instead of linear correlation that usually uh, you would have here, you're trying to discover this non-linear correlation between low fidelity and high fidelity. And neural networks are very good in discovering these functions. So the construction here is that we have the low fidelity data. Usually you have a lot of low fidelity data. We can construct very accurately the function approximation of that, which is fed into a high fidelity neural network. In fact, two, two segments of neural of high fidelity. One will have linear activation functions to capture the linear part. Another part will be the nonlinear, will be activated with nonlinear activation functions. And then the objective is from the data, from this data to try and to find F. So if we put all this together, here's what you have the data, the high fidelity data, the low fidelity data you see here on the lower panel. On the right, you will see what you would get, a wrong signal, a wrong, an erroneous reconstruction using um, uh, only high fidelity data. However, here on the panel, the right bottom, you can see that you can reconstruct, even with this adversarial data, uh, you can reconstruct the signal, as you can see, very accurately. The key to this, and this is, of course, a, a fabricated problem, just to see if we can do it. It's a, it's a proof of concept. The key is to find this function f that I mentioned earlier. This is not a trivial function, although it's a parabola here. It's a parabola that is changing. We don't know that, of course. We're trying to discover it through the data. And we're doing a pretty good job, as you can see here, to discover this correlation function, which connects the low fidelity to a high fidelity and filter out, filters out the erroneous adversarial data. So this is very important. And now the question is, how does that relate to engineering? How does that relate to uh, physics and so on? So in the next example, I will show you a case where the low fidelity will be a some model that you have, a physical model that is based on physical laws. The high fidelity will be real data. And one of the open problems right now in materials, in materials characterization, especially 3D printed materials, uh, which are uh, processed differently, so the microstructure of these 3D printed materials is very different from the standard materials for aluminum, alloys, alloys of, uh, or the titanium alloys. Therefore, their mechanical properties are very different. In fact, here I show some examples of uh, titanium that shows that uh, if you try to, uh, using this uh, nano indentation technique, if you try to infer the modules of elasticity, especially the yield stress, the yield stress is over 100% wrong given standard methods. Now, the idea here of the multi-fidelity uh, data and neural networks is to use the physics as low fidelity. So we use thousands or hundreds and thousands of, of finite element simulations with a few experimental data for titanium, for example, say five, 10 experimental data. And we can bring down by doing that in this inverse yield pose problem, we can bring down the error from over 100% to less than 4% on the yield stress. And again, here, we use the data to improvise from the fact that the microstructure of 3D print materials, which are almost sort, sort of two-dimensional because of the layering process, is very different from what we're used to and the, and the technology that we already have developed. So that's an example where we bring physics through a low fidelity and we use the data as high fidelity. 
What I'm going to, do, to, to talk about next is about pins, which directly encode the physics as conservation laws into the neural network. So this is the reference here. And now, <clears throat> as you will see, this method is very, very simple. Uh, <clears throat> I will explain it first. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so, so this is kind of a sketch that I really want you to remember. So a neural network, what we were talking about so far is this function u depending on x and t, the input, and we try to identify the weights and the bias and so on here. Now, we don't have enough data. We don't have 10,000 points for this function, but we know that this function satisfies here uh, in a, a parameterized PDE, in this case, a um, uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, for example. So, so this is constrained, has to, F here has to be zero. So by, <clears throat> by imposing the physics here, not only you honoring the conservation law and the correct physics, but at the same time, you providing new data. You sort of have uh, this sort of supervised learning, if you like, that comes from the conservation laws. So if you evaluate this conservation law at random points, uh, then you can construct a loss function to add to the mismatch of the data, which we then minimize with standard methods. Now, one of the key points here to avoid having standard um, discretizations is that all this is done with automatic differentiation, the same technique that is used to back propagate the error and train this neural network. So it's really very compact. It's, it's very simple to do this. And in fact, in this next example, I will show you, um, you don't have any grids. You remove this tyranny of generating grids, even for very complex applications. Uh, and, and also you preserve the accuracy because you don't introduce artificial uh, dissipation or dispersion, all these artifacts that we know from numerical analysis uh, could make these solutions erroneous, especially in long term, in long time integration. So, um, so, so this has been, PINs has had a huge success, especially in industry, because it's very, very simple, as I said. There's not, there's not a lot of sophistication. The theory, as I, I I'll show you, uh, is not there yet, uh, but um, NVIDIA, as a parallel code that now gives for free to academia. Uh, ANSYS is working very hard to replace a lot of their codes with pins, and Siemens also is trying to develop digital twins based on this technology. And the reason, as I said, is very simple. Here I have an example where a graduate student would start, um, uh, let's say, now to solve a Berger's equation, and writing a code of 10, about 10 lines like this, you can define the neural network on the, on the, on the left using TensorFlow. You can take the gradients using, uh, to construct the residual F that I talked about. Uh, finally, you can wait or just add up the contributions to the loss function and basically where you are done. What you see here, this XT domain is the points I use. I use some points for initial conditions. I use some random points for boundary conditions. And then you don't see the points I use inside the domain. This will be the random points where we evaluate this residual at randomly. This can be done in about an hour, and the, and the joke is that even professors now can program their own ideas uh, just using 10 lines of code. The results are pretty accurate, as you can see for this uh, benchmark problem where we know the exact solution of the viscous Berger equation. Now, you, you may have seen this before, or you haven't seen this one because this is a new result by one of my postdocs, Ameya Jakta. Uh, he came up with, um, with a new version of XPIN that does domain decomposition in space-time. Uh, having a, a dual decomposition like that, as you understand, that's, very, that's huge for applications, especially because you can do a parallel in space and time now. So this is now the same problem I showed you before, XT, except I have two domains. One is this blue sea of points where I construct, I compute the, my residual. And the other one is inside this dolphin, we have different points. So I have two different neural networks. I can do it in parallel. I can have different activation functions, different points and so on. You can see for multi-scale, multi-physics problems, problems where you have steep gradients, this is very, very important. So the only requirement is also very simple. There's no method that I know. I work on lots of methods, as you may know in, in my life, including the discontinuous galeric methods. You cannot have a domain like this because you, it's convex, non-convex, and uh, concave, and so on. You cannot take. You don't require to take uh, to, to have continuity of fluxes. The only thing that you require is this: the residual to be continuous because we know it's zero at the boundaries. So you can see down here that again, using approximately the same uh, the same number of lines of code, 
you have seamless uh, a solution uh, uh, between the uh, one domain and the other. And of course, you can do it twice as fast. You can do it, uh, you can have 10, 10 domains with 10 neural networks each, each domain on, on different GPU, and you can do it really, really fast. So something that PINs did not have before, uh, that is speed, in especially in training, now you can do it really fast and you can be uh, even conventional methods, which was not possible for forward problems, um, inverse problems, of course, are handled. So XPIN is a, is a sort of, a generalized domain decomposition. I'm not going to say too much about it because I have a lot of other things to, to cover, but you can see the capability, for example, in this X, you can decompose this domain X in sub networks and, and choose accordingly. I want to show you a few examples from mechanics, first fluid mechanics, then solid mechanics, to show you how we can use creatively these pins in applications where other methods would not solve. So again, my idea, my, my purpose here is not to replace all the methods that people have developed for many, many years, which are very good, and I'll show you how you can use them in conjunction with depot nets later. But the idea is to show how you can solve ill-posed problems. And this is one. For example, in this paper we published in Science in February, we asked the question, can you determine only from dive visualizations the flow field, the pressure, and the velocity field in an arbitrary domain where you have a video of, uh, of uh, the dye or a smoke visualization? The answer is yes. I don't need to know the boundary conditions. I don't need to know the geometry. I will exploit the gradients I have as information. That's my only data. And that is a passive scalar, which is coupled to the Navier-Stokes equation. So I, I know that much. I can encode it using automatic differentiation into a, um, a, a, this composite neural network. And then I can extract the velocity, the pressure uh, in this patch. I cannot say anything else around it because I, I assume that, that I don't know anything about this problem. If, if I have a flow visualization around the body, I can even compute the forces and that is shown here. Uh, this now is an attempt to use smoke visualization, the strict lines to compute forces directly. This is something very, very useful from people who are doing experiments in wind tunnels and, and, and uh, towing tanks. And that is now can be done just from flow visualizations without any knowledge of anything else you don't even need to know the range number and so on. That also can be inferred from this data as long as you have enough data in time space. Um, so how else can this be used? We can be used in rescue operations in the hurricane season, for example. You know that in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, um, in this, especially this region here, uh, pre, uh, the region called laser, there's lots of uh, hurricanes. And, and I can use surface temperature from satellite data. It's something I've, I've been doing for a while now at MIT and the Boston Harbor. I, I use satellite data to infer the surface uh, temperature. And from that, I can go directly to infer the currents, what's, what's called now estimated flow field. And, uh, and that is done, of course, in less than a second, uh, instead of using uh, ocean, assimilating the data into regional models and, and trying to infer the field, which will take uh, uh, a lot of effort and, uh, and, and uh, um, supercomputing resources. Um, let me get some feedback. Jason, everything is working so far in terms of the video, the, the sound? Everything is going swimmingly. Thank you very much, Jason. So let me um, show you another example, very timely, uh, especially with the second or third wave that in front of us. Uh, this is what we found on the, that's how we became friends with this German company, La Vision. They, we found this on uh, YouTube video. We took it and we said, can we quantify, how can we actually see how, what's the velocity field out of this uh, person uh, mouth when uh, he, uh, he puffs or sneezes with and without the, uh, 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 and, and no other information. So down here, I show you just the pressure field, the puff of a pressure field. This is now a dynamic pressure field that we infer from Schlieren photography with a mask, without, uh, without a mask, with a mask, you can see that the, this path is not there. And also we can estimate that the velocity with the mask is 10 times smaller for this particular than the without the mask. So you can infer, you can do quantitative uh, things that you wouldn't be able uh, otherwise. This is another example we had the, in the science paper. This is a real application. A doctor is faced with the question, uh, when would this uh, aneurysm, a brain aneurysm will rupture? Um, as engineers and, and, and uh, with mechanics people, we know that this is associated with wall shear stress at the wall. You don't have the aneurysmal wall. This is a sac, it's a dilation. 
you don't know exactly. The doctor doesn't know. So, they have, so by naked eye, will say, well, it's big enough. I, I better do an operation. That's not good enough for precision medicine that we preach these days in the NIH. It's uh, very big on precision medicine. Uh, so, so we're using this technique, just having from a, a dye, a contrasting agent. This is a real picture. You can actually compute uh, very accurately the pressure on this aneurysm, aneurysmal wall, as well as the uh, wall shear stress. This is an example here. And you can only do it here. You don't need the whole flow as we do, for example, with the CFD solver. But you can use a CFD solver for certain conditions to verify that what you learn is correctly. This is instantaneous streamlines. So this has real value uh, uh, and people will take it and make it technology that uh, they are, as, as we speak, uh, useful technology in this case. When does the brain aneurysm rupture? Um, I, want, I want to show you some examples in solid mechanics. A lot of them re are related to the inverse problem, especially when, if you have voids, uh, inclusions inside the material. This is a specimen and we just uh, pull it in a biaxial bi fashion here. It's a hyperelastic material, so it, um, it deforms a lot, actually. But we only pretend we have measurements of displacement away from the hole. We don't know where the hole is. And we only have displacement measurements where I have these red sensors. I assume that I, kn I know the incompressible, that the material is incompressible on Neohuikian. But I may not know, for example, the modules of elasticity if you have inclusions and so on. So where is the hole? How big it is? Uh, this is a very difficult problem because you don't know the topology and you cannot assume it. Uh, you, can, you cannot remesh many times. Here I show you that we can identify, this is, uh, we parameterize the shape. This is a very simple shape, an ellipse, but we can find the, very quickly, the loss function down here converges. And you can see the deformation is huge. So this is now a case of moving domains where you need uh, probably six months with Abacus to solve this problem. It's an inverse problem. Um, now, this is a real problem. This is a DARPA hackathon that I participated, my, my team participated some time ago. Uh, this is data from the Air Force, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force uh, base gave this data. So the idea is, how can you detect cracks in a, in a material using only ultrasound? Um, they gave us the data, and the data here is on the left. You can see a video, it's moving slowly. Uh, the pin result is on the right. You can see that we reproduce this data on ultrasound. And in the process, we involve the physics, namely the wave propagation. And therefore, we can compute this speed, the crack, the velocity, C, which is a function of space time of, of, of space here. If you do that, basically, you can characterize um, this uh, crack very, very accurately. It's a surface crack, but you can do th similar things with deep uh, immers immersive uh, um, cracks. Now, None of the teams in the DARPA project were able, there was like a dozen teams were able to do that uh, for two reasons. In fact, they asked for, they said, this is too little data. We use only 10% of the data. Then we use physics to improvise. So 10% of the data plus physics was good enough to give us very, very accurate answers. The other trick that, that we did was to introduce, and that's what, that's what I want to, to make a point here, that, that when you work with these real time problems, real, real world problems, you really have to push the envelope. You really have to push the envelope for neural networks. So that, uh, this problem in particular, we introduce adaptive activation functions. That is, right now, every neuron has the same activation function, but there's no need for it. In fact, you can make, you can parameterize the activation functions of the neurons and make those hyperparameters inside the activation function. So now every neuron or every layer, if you like, if you don't want every neuron, every layer of neurons, every hidden layer, could fire at, the, at its own rate. And by doing that, you can really handle noise, you can handle uh, outliers, you can, handle, uh, you can have robustness. And that, uh, that is something that, um, that uh, we did. We also proved that adaptive activation functions is like doing second order um, uh, uh, gradient descent, but without having to compute the Hessian, which as you know, is very expensive. And that's recent work that we published and we have theory about it. So I want to conclude here with pins. We have all sorts of color pins, uh, conservative pins for high speed flows, uh, for hypersonics, supersonics, variational pins, parallel in time, stochastic, and so on. I show you X pins. I want to show you how we handle stochastic pins. This is an effort we did early on, and we um, adopted um, uh, uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks, uh, because it, we, 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 we realized and we actually proved that uh, a noise at 
even with the wrong dimensional noise, you can generate any arbitrary PDF that you like, any stochastic process. Uh, so, so, of course, you have the generator, you have the discriminator. That's, this is sort of a se semi-supervised learning. But, but in solving stochastic PDEs, like the one that I have here on upper right, in this stochastic PDE, it's a simple one D model, but I assume that I don't know the right-hand side. I know I have a few measurements on F, I have a few measurements on U, and I have a few measurements on, the, on this hydraulic conductivity. I don't know anything about any of these fields. I just have some realizations at some points of these fields, so they're all three stochastic fields. So by extending the GAN approach, you can embed this green layer here where you can generate uh, fields for F, for the boundary conditions, and then you can feed the generator, the discriminator. So the discriminator is, is uh, in, including the fake data that you have for, for K and for U also, uh, or real data. So by doing that, you can handle high dimensional problem. In the first paper, we had 120 dimensions. In a subsequent application uh, for um, porous media uh, modeling of uh, what's called the Hanford nuclear waste site, not far from where Jason and Nathan and, and Steve are sitting in Richland, Washington, where all, most of the nuclear waste of the United States is buried. We, um, it's a huge uh, area, it's 75 uh, miles, I think, or kilometers, I don't remember exactly area, but, uh, but the very precise monitoring of what's going on has to be taken, take place. And we use a thousand data, we use from a thousand wells uh, to demonstrate that uh, uh, and, and the dimensionality uh, of that stochastic uh, simulation was 10,000, 10,000 using this. It turns out that we don't quite beat the curse of dimensionality here, but we don't have this explosive uh, exponential growth of, of the cost with the dimensionality. So this is a good approach. It can be improved physics informed guns for stochastic PDs. Uh, the last uh, slide on pins is these variational pins for those who like uh, finite elements. Here, if you use a Petrogalerkin approach, you can mix the spaces. And that makes it really exciting also from the theoretical point of view. In this uh, Poisson equation, you can integrate once or twice. You can use Petrogalerkin, continu uh, continuous or discontinuous Petrogalerkin methods. But now the space, the trial space is the neural network, this adaptive nonlinear approximation that I showed you earlier, with test functions which are smooth. It could be Legendre polynomials, it could be monomials, it could be signs. So here I use a single layer just to show an analytically what these residuals look like. So I use signs as a adaptive activation functions and I can write down explicitly the residuals and you can see uh, it's interesting that it's very different method than any of the other methods that are out there, even in that simplest form of a shallow network. Now, for those of you who uh, have been around for a long time, I don't know if you remember the uh, circus of finite elements in the early 60s, I was also young at the time, but I know that, uh, that they were trying to go around and, and advertise uh, finite elements at the time, just like we do now with neural networks. And there's, of course, a lot of hype and so on. And theory didn't come soon enough for finite elements. It took more than 30 years before some theory is established for finite elements. Thankfully, this is not the case here. There are lots of smart postdocs and, and, and young professors and so on who are part of my group also in other parts of the world are, are working on the convergence and generalization of, of this type of approximations where you combine. It's different than neural networks because now you minimize on a manifold. So it's a very different on a, on a, on a, uh, on a, it's a very different uh, setup. But in this paper, for example, uh, what we show is that you can actually have convergence of elliptic and parabolic problems even without boundary conditions. The convergence is in the L2 norm. Uh, if you include the boundary conditions, you can show convergence in the H1 norm. Uh, this is on the archive, so you can find it. A paper that we have not put in the archive yet uh, quantifies also error estimates for, uh, for this type of uh, PDEs, both for the continuous, but also the discrete formulation. And this whole idea uh, is a new idea, is based on the equivalence of norms, and, and, and uh, I will not give you the details yet, but we'll put this on the archive. Um, uh, soon. It's a complete paper. So I'll take a break here to move to the next segment, and that is what if you want to have an autonomous destroyer of the U.S. Navy uh, swimming through uh, 20 meters waves in the North Atlantic? So there are no sailors in this, uh, no captains, uh, and no crew. 
So, so you want to navigate and you want to find out the dynamic motion of this, uh, of this destroyer. Is it possible to do that with CFD? Yes, this is actually an open form simulation. It took more than a, a week uh, of uh, simulation. Uh, the, the spectrum is, uh, of, of the sea is uh, realistic, it corresponds to North Atlantic. It's a stochastic elevation of the sea. And we're looking at the flow and the response in this fluid structure interaction problem. It's a very complex problem. CFD is, is advanced enough to do it, but it's not fast enough to tell us where in real time, uh, how would, um, what's, what's this, what's called the sea keeping, the dynamic motion of this uh, destroyer. So, of course, that's very important for autonomy, for cars, for uh, airplanes, for ships, and so on. So, so I want to introduce uh, deep uh, FNet for functional, because if we have a network that could spit out the answer very quickly, then we can actually use it in real time. This is where you use all your existing solvers can be really, really handy and useful uh, here. So first of all, I ask the question, can we use neural networks? So this is the second theory of my promise. Can we use neural networks to approximate functionals? And in fact, I found this nice paper by Chen and Chen from Fudan University back at the same time as the Saipengo theorem of functional, of functional approximation. This is now for functionals. And it shows, yes, indeed, for a scalar case, for multidimensional case, you can have this approximation, universal approximation for functionals. And of course, you have to build appropriate um, neural networks for, so that you have a small generalization error and also you can train those networks. But at least from the approximation point of view, there is a rigorous uh, theory. So then you go out there and you see what is on, like Google, for example, has produced the sequence to sequence, which is a, 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 a pair of, uh, of LSTMs. They use it for uh, natural uh, language processing. But here one can use it there, or we can use uh, just an LSTM where you use as an input the stochastic elevation of the C as an output will be, let's say, the six degrees of freedom or three degrees of freedom here are interesting my, primarily for heaving and uh, for heave and roll and so on. And, and um, you can actually make predictions with offline training. It takes a while with these expensive computations, but using CFD to train this deep F net, you can then make predictions, long-term predictions. Uh, and you can see here the CFD for unseen data. This is a real testing. You can see we're doing very well in predicting the stochastic response to this stochastic input. I have to say that the spectrum has a finite uh, of, uh, number of frequencies. It's not an explosive spectrum. That's where the success is here. But every C has its own spectrum. So one, this, one can adjust this for other, for the Mediterranean, for example. Next segment is about going to abstractions. And, um, and uh, true intelligence requires abstractions. I think people realize that now that uh, function approximation is not enough to express higher level of abstractions. You really need to um, go to a higher level and that can be done by nonlinear. So the next discover, can we build, can we design neural networks which approximate nonlinear operators? Let's say continuous nonlinear operators. Uh, so this is a teaser for robots because you don't, if, if, if you are to teach robots calculus the way we have taught and then, then this robot to do any computations, any meaningful computations and decide fast what to move, it has to, to carry a hexaflop computer on its head and that's not possible from the energetic point of view. So the same people, Chen and Chen, published two years later, uh, this landmark paper, in my opinion, that uh, very few people know about it. Uh, it's one of perhaps the... The, the best secret, um, uh, the best kept secret in approximation theory, uh, certainly for neural networks, but it, it does say similarly to the functional approximation and the functional approximation. Here now, G is the nonlinear continuous operator we try to approximate. G of U of Y is what we're trying to approximate. The output, U is the input. U will come from this space V of functions in this compact space. And basically the theorem says that there is this, this construction here that they propose, which has, it's a composite neural network. One is associated with the output. You can see Y is the output, G of U of Y, where you want to, to compute your output. And Y, this, this output now is a network, and you can realize that by having sigma here, which denotes a activation function. And then there's another sigma here for this 
another neural network which is associated with the input, u of xj is where the sampling of u as an input from this space v is, um, is taken. Now, one of the limitations of, of this theorem is, um, is that v is a compact space. But it turns out, and we realize that now after lots of experiments, that v doesn't have to be a, a compact space. For example, you can learn, um, let's say, a Legend transform. You can learn integration, finite integration, but you also you can, you can learn uh, integration with infinite integrals with the Laplace transforms and so on. So you can learn both explicit operators, implicit operators, and you can learn operators that you don't know just from data by doing that. Of course, the key question is, how do you realize that in real life? How do you implement this? How do you optimize this? And most importantly, the theorem doesn't tell you anything about um, generalization error, which is important, as you may appreciate. First, this is very similar to Saipengo for a single layer. So my collaborators, a bunch of young people, um, uh, Handy Zhang and, and others from WPI, uh, just uh, uh, derived this theorem, which is not published yet. The theorem extends the Chen and Chen theorem to arbitrary neural networks, deep neural networks. So you can have, as long as you have a branch which is represented by GN, this neural network, a deep neural network, for example, of any type, this trunk, then this, this theorem is valid as long as you have a V, uh, again, the compact space and G is a nonlinear continuous operator. Let me explain what we are talking about. And this is the problem set up. I have a bunch of functions, U, and I want to map them to G of U. G will be this nonlinear mapping, this nonlinear operator. So I go from RD to R, let's say. Or from. Now, so I take a first function, a second function, a third function, and so on, 10,000 functions, and then for the 11th thousand function, I want to know what is g of u of y. So if you look at the panel B here, it explains it a little better. The input is on the left, the output is on the right. This is labeled data. I don't use physics at this point. This is data driven where the inputs are functions, not data. So I have a function, which here I sample with, uh, let's say, m points and m points, let's say 100 points. But notice on the output, I only observe my output only at a few points. This is very important because if I have my output in space time, I don't need to sample too much of the output. And this is what we have in time. Now, as I said, this is a composite neural network. Deponet is a composite neural network. And the way to realize it is in this construction, realize this approximation theorem, is this um, uh, construct here that was uh, proposed by, by Lulu and, and, and others in this paper, which will appear in Nature Machine Intelligence soon. Uh, um, we just got the final revision uh, today. Uh, so, so what you see here, we have two parts. The, the branch network is associated with this part, the big parentheses, where we sample the input space. You can have many functions. You can have uh, different types of functions. You can have uh, uh, two different spaces. And then you have also the output. The output could be a multi-output. But the point is you can do this crossing, just what you do here with this multiplication, uh, by, by schematically by having this. Um, there are other ways to implement this, sequence to sequence, so it also does operators and so on. The question is, which will give you the smallest generalization error? In other words, for unseen data, not just for training data, for unseen data, where would the testing error be as small as possible? So I want to illustrate this with a very simple example, something we learn in calculus. I want, that's the one dimensional integral. So I want G now, I take U functions, I will take 10,000 of them. I will observe the integral S of X, uh, you can see x is from some interval 0 to 1, it could be 0 to 100. But x is, is, is a variable, of course, so s of x is a function. So I go from function, the integrand, to an integral, which is a function. g is that, this operator here. So I learn, I'm going to learn this from 10,000 fa different functions, which I pull from a Gauss random field. So you have to define, that's very important, the v input space, how you define it, what correlation length you do, and so on, it's very important. Uh, but notice that I only observe the output at one point. I only have like S of 0.3, S of 0.5 and so on. And I use 100, as I said, 100 points to, to uh, sample this function. The better way is to do this. U of X itself, the input itself, could be a neural network based on function approximation. So you can see here in my mean square error versus number of iterations that the training error and testing error for unseen data is about the same. This is the network I just showed you. Here I, on the right, I compare different networks. This is the unstacked network that I told you about. Uh, we use uh, 
the fully connected neural network, you can see the huge generalization error, the difference between test and training, other networks, CNNs and ResNets and so on, sequence to sequence. There may be cases where CNN could be very good. There may be cases where, so you can try different things, but uh, this is now where you're looking at generalization error. One of the surprising elements, and this is shown with this gravity pendulum with an external force, U of T now will map to S1 and S2. So notice that the spaces of input output, they don't have to be the same. It's a nonlinear problem. But what we observe here is that learning can be exponentially fast. If we look at this middle panel, we have a neural network with a width of 100. You can see you have an exponential, initially an exponential convergence, which is really, really good news. Eventually, unfortunately, we saturate the network. So we we'll go back to standard sampling of Monte Carlo, which has to do with the, how you represent the inputs in this space. But we can show that as you increase the width of the network, this point, the transition point between exponential convergence and, and this uh, slow convergence uh, moves to the right. Uh, so you go from below 10 to the 4, you can see here above 10 to the 4. So one, there may be some magic network and some smart guy out there who could come up with a good network that really learns exponentially fast. And that's very important because here, this is not a, a trivial job to learn operators. After you learn operators, you can compute very fast. I have a few examples. In the paper that I show you in, in, in Nature, we'll have about 16 different cases where we learn stochastic operators. My favorite ones, which are fractional operators and other, and other um, uh, explicit and implicit operators. Here, I want to show you some uh, real problems. This is uh, cavitation and, and generation of bubbles at the, mic, at the mic, mic, mesoscopic scale and the, the nanobubbles. So we generate bubbles here using this nonlinear Rayleigh plus equation. We pretend we don't know it. Can we learn this very quickly? The answer is yes, if you take the input as the pressure difference. Uh, the pressure of the ambient minus the bubble pressure. That will be now the input to the branch. The output will be the time. And very quickly, uh, and uh, we can find the radius, how this grows. So here, here's some examples. I, again, I have a space here where I, I pull my input functions. This is a V space. Uh, this would be also a GRF. And then I train the network. You can see some of the characteristics of the brain, of the branch and the, and the trunk. Uh, but this down here is a three instances of a bubble oscillating. It's a nonlinear equation, as viscosity has surface tension and so on. And we can capture this multi-rate problem. So the op and you can do that in 0.01 second. So after you train the operator offline, you can, com you can uh, predict this on, uh, online uh, very quickly for unseen data for pressure differences that you haven't used before. It doesn't matter where the data comes from. In this case, for example, I have a nanobubble. I use molecular dynamic simulation type. I pull the, the walls of this box apart and I change my pressure distribution. Here on the left, you can see I create an arbitrary pressure distribution and also have these thermal fluctuations that I could sort of capture here. But certainly I can capture the mean growth of this bubble uh, very accurately. Um, this is another example. I have not presented this in public before. This is the first seminar I present now. Um, this problem was uh, presented to DARPA before uh, based on this type of work. DARPA wants to start a whole program on depot net. So we are looking at electroconvection problem similar to thermal convection, except everything is driven by electric potential. You can see here in the top, we have a potential which is small, therefore we just have like conduction, just like the diffusion. Then we have this nice fingering patterns and so on as we increase delta phi, the, the potential, the electric potential across. The system of equations here is, is here. We have cations, we have anions, we have this um, sort of uh, a passive scalar equation, but there's actually some nonlinearity in here. So we want to learn this multi-physics operator, multi-scale multi-physics operator using deep nets. And the way to do it, we train from generating from CFD solver. Uh, we, ge we generate data, as you can see here, are different in this movie. I show the data that I use it in, in increments of five in the electric potential. And you can see the flow qualitative changes from steady state to this um, convection patterns uh, to this fingering mechanism. So we, we go through different bifurcations of the flow, if you like. Now, the aim here is to construct a depot net for each one of the fields, G, U, G, V, G cations, G anions, okay? Given so that you can see the input is a two-dimensional field 
Uh, these are, I'm looking at steady states here for simplicity, and the outputs are also fields. So the depot net, the inputs are functions, the output will be functions, and approximates one conservation law of the entire multiphysics operator. So you can also approximate the entire one. So this is a setup just for the accuracy now for unseen data in this domain, uh, 62.15, I never use this. And you can see my accuracy is 10 to the minus five, which is as good as it gets with these neural networks. The, I also plot here on the right, I don't know if you can see it very small, but the boundary layers of, for concentrations are extremely steep. It's more steeper than terrible boundary layers, as you can see, because of the Debye layer being very small, about 10 to the minus three. Now, a realistic problem, how you put together now depot nets, which are pre-trained building blocks for multi-physics problems. So you have already pre-trained depot nets. You have tested that they can do a good job, but they need fee this potential. Of course, this is just a Poisson solver, but it is coupled to the concentrations because the right-hand side of, of this uh, Poisson equation is really the difference in the charge, which C plus and C minus. So we set up this deep M &M, which is another neural network, which approximates phi. Now that feeds these building blocks, depot nets. Those produce the fields that you want for cations and the velocity. Now those, if I input these cations and anions to, uh, to the depot net for the, that, that have pre-trained, I get a phi. I have some measurements. And in this architecture, I can compare now and I can basically finalize this very quickly. So this is the, the, the concept of deep M, &M. It beats any conventional solver because of the speed, of course. And here's a, the results. You can see here on this panel, I have phi, which I sampled just like 10 points, you can see. And then from 10 points, 10 measurements on phi, you can build this whole thing and you can do that in 0.1 second. So we're about 10,000 times faster than what I would do with the CFD solver starting from scratch. Uh, have a thing, I think I have a few more minutes and this is my last example. I'll finish in, in about three, four minutes. This is a same idea for hypersonics, a very hot topic these the days. But now we're talking about hypersonics, post-shock hypersonics. We've done it also with shocks, but this is post-shock just to show that the we have dissociation, non-equilibrium chemistry with seven, seven different fields and, and build a, a deep m, m around it. But you can see here for Mach number eight to 10, which we'll, we'll have, we, we have dissociation of nitrogen and oxygen uh, with different species. Can we capture the chemistry? Because the chemistry has very, is very fast, it's a multi-rate problem, a very difficult problem. So the idea is again to go to a depot net, train depot nets for these, each one of these species. We give the mechanical part, the fluid mechanical part would be the velocity, the temperature, and produce the chemistry. Okay? So we pre-train that. Um, inversely, we can include chemistry if we want. Very rarely you have data on chemistry, but if you have, you can also predict velocity fields from that. And, you, and this is what I'm talking about. We actually use about 200 trajectories um, in this Mach number eight to 10. We use 60 trajectories to test, but you can see here, for example, in this plot for, uh, uh, for N, uh, uh, nitrogen, it's, it's, we have a ten, eight, eight orders of magnitude change in the magnitude of, in the concentration. So this is a very difficult problem. It's not trivial, especially with neural networks. So this is an example to first check that we actually can predict with depot net in 0.01 second, we can predict given the velocity and the temperature field, we can predict all the chemistry very accurately. And here is different profiles for unseen data. You can do this the opposite, start from chemistry, you can do that. But most importantly, you can build using plug and play, as I said, you can use these building blocks of depot nets to build any multi-physics problems. So remember this, it's offline. You train this network with generic fields of U and T. Now you have some measurements on U and T. Um, of course, they are closer to what you're targeting, the better, but you have some data. You, you build this deep m, m architecture just as before. From the U and T, you can produce this. Then you have, um, uh, of course, this is an iterative because you don't know if that's, that's the correct answer. But here you have the loss function, which uses both the operator. So it constrains the operator on phi because you also have the operator on U and, uh, sorry, on U and T. You have these operators and then you have data and you can put some regularization to train this. And indeed, with just a few points, three, four points on the velocity and temperature, 
you can now have a multi-physics, multi-chemistry, hypersonics uh, uh, result, which is as difficult as it gets. Uh, we have some other results I cannot show you yet, but hopefully um, uh, in the future. Uh, overall, for this simple problem, and this is one the problem, the, f the, the solver should be fast, but because of, of the chemistry, you use very small time step and we can beat with deep m, &M we have 10,000, more than 10,000 times speed up in terms of, uh, of speed. And, and as I said, it is not trivial, we have eight orders of magnitude. I started with coffee, I wanted to, 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 to finish with coffee. And this is now the magic mug. You, can, you may want to see that, the, you may be able to see also that the mug has a, a pin on it and we use pin to infer the, this is the real data on the left. This is the data from hidden fluid mechanics. And by the way, I call it hid, hidden fluid mechanics because it does look like a hidden Markov process. We're given data on an auxiliary quantity and we're trying to go after the primary quantity, namely velocity and the pressure, the pressure here is on the right. Now I have to tell you that uh, when we talked to La Vision, we said, well, we're predicting velocity here on the right, which is about 0.4 meters per second. And I didn't believe it myself. They did some uh, uh, estimates using uh, the optical flow they have and other, and they said, no, no, no. It's actually the maximum velocity is 0.08 meters per second, not 0.4 meters per second. And I kind of believe them, but they didn't believe their own estimates and they went back and they did independently a particle image velocimetry experiment, PIV, which will give you the magnitude of velocity. And they found that the maximum velocity is 0 0.4 point, uh, to 0 0.45. A little, <laughs> exactly in the range that we, that, that, that the, um, uh, that the pin predicted. So that, again, this is sort of highlights what, what it's all about. This is not about accuracy. This is not about to, to, to replace what we have, but is actually to enhance the ability to do this. For those of you students and professors who want to use this, DeepXD is the library that uh, we built. I think there's are now 56,000 downloads the, uh, the last time I checked of this library. It's very easy to, to, to build it. You can dial in the equation. X is the equation that you want. It could be a fractional equation stochastic equation, it has some flexibility with the geometry and so on, but it's, it's not so much for industry, it's more like an, an educational tool and, and there's a SIAM review paper which will appear that goes with that, but uh, there's also a deep XD paper in the archive. And with that, I would like to um, thank um, my group. Um, it's a big group, I, um, the crunch group. I actually was uh, kidding with, um, with Nate and I said, you know, maybe we can, one day we can merge my group with his group. And today we sort of merge them virtually um, because we, at the same time at noon today in Boston, we have in Providence, we have our own seminar. So we actually merge uh, our seminars with uh, um, the seminars that Nathan and, and uh, Stephen and, and Jason and, and Andrew and, and all the other dynamic uh, postdocs put together. So this is um, to advertise the and support of these films. It's a center that I start on physics informed learning. Uh, almost uh, five years ago, DOE didn't believe it. Now they like it, the industry likes it. So, so thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karnadakis. Um, I believe if, if you're okay with it, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, let me make sure that, so if you do have questions, um, feel free to either raise your hand or put them in the chat. I'm not sure the chat functionality is, is completely uh, set up right now. So if you, um, maybe what's, and if you're watching live on YouTube as well, uh, feel free to uh, put the questions into the chat there and they can be relayed to us uh, by, by our administrators on YouTube. Um, either I'm missing something or there doesn't seem to be. I, I see that somebody raised their hand. Eric, 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 Eric Shea Brown raised his hand there. Does that come up on your list, Jason? Yeah, here we go. Um, Eric, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you'd like to ask in person. Sure. Is that working? <laughs> Uh, great. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. super. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I just wanted to ask, could you please tell us a little bit more about the specific sequence to sequence 
uh, set up and when that is an important uh, factor in terms of defining, I guess, the cost function that'll make useful predictions. Thank you. Um, sequence to Sequence is a Google product um, and actually you can find on the GitHub that everything is free. So, so there is basically two LSTM back to back. Um, since then, so, so you have an encoder decoder. Uh, since then, there are uh, more refined versions of that. Um, we use for, for, for time series forecasting. Uh, we use it actually in, uh, for COVID-19 and other applications, uh, engineering applications. We use uh, sequence to sequence with um, attention mechanism. So that actually can give you, it's pretty, pretty robust, I would say, for uh, short-term predictions, uh, even, even for complex dynamics. So this is more like for, for time series forecasting, uh, just like uh, for, for, for deep, uh, what, uh, what, I, what I call functional approximation and the functional is in time. We also apply to a solar panel where we had two inputs. For example, we had a, um, uh, the temperature, ambient temperature and the solar radiation. We could predict the um, state of the charge. So it does have some, uh, 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 it, actually, it, it, I, I, I was not using it because it was not a domain, but, but someone from uh, one of our reviewers in that Nature paper said, uh, he said, why don't you use, use um, sequence to sequence? Because that also, that, that comes from NLP and it, it is representing operators and we use it. Um, it. It does work, but it doesn't have the exponential convergence, for example, or the generalization, the small generalization error that um, the depot net has. So I, I would use sequence to sequence perhaps with um, the attention mechanisms for time series forecasting. Uh, depends on the problem, short term or long term, but not, not too long term. Yeah. It's a very simple architecture. It's two LSTM connected, basically. So I think there's there's two more questions. Uh, John V, if you'd like to go first, I've you can unmute. First of all, really excellent talk. Um, and these results for these problems, which are are normally very very hard to solve, um, the fact that you can solve them so accurately and so fast. It's, it's really stunning. Um, I wanted to ask kind of a philosophical question. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you pointed out that there's different ways that people think about neural networks and stuff versus physics. And oftentimes people just kind of use physics with small data or lots of data, not that much physics. Um, do you think this is kind of where the field is going as far as maximizing the power of deep learning for science? And what do you think the next steps are for really getting the most out of that? Um, I, I think, uh, John, this is a good question. I, I, um, you remember I showed that um, uh, three different scenarios of having lots of physics, very little data, having some data, some physics, and uh, I, th I think I think I, I really believe I work a lot of with engineers, geophysicists. Uh, I work with I work with fishermen. I work with lobstermen in Boston Harbor. Okay, believe it, believe it or not. And and there's all sort of data out there. I I um, and the question is how do you fair, how you best assimilate this data because the data is not where you want it to be. Uh, there's noise everywhere. There's uncertainty, and the systems are very coupled and interconnected. And and, and I think this data play the role of a closure of a, phys, of, a of a missing link of uh, of subgrid closures, if you like, of of, uh, uh, of of like you have a gray box and you're trying to uh, paint it. So there are many different ways of doing of including physics. I show you two or three ways. Um, there's a nice paper we just invited uh, Vipin Kumar from University of Minnesota and his student to give a talk to my group about, it's a, it's a nice review paper about uh, physics guided, I think it, he, he calls it, and, um, and with emphasis on geophysics where you have lots of data and, and lots of uncertainties. And they have um, categorized this in, in three, four, four, five different groups actually on how you can incorporate physics into neural networks. Uh, Stephen Branton and, and Nathan also have uh, um, their own contributions and so on. What is what is uh, the best approach? I, I cannot really tell you, but I know for the current project for deep uh, for the depot net that um, that DARPA is really excited about is they and and I talked to the, the um, 
to, to the director of DSO and, and they said they're really interested to see to, uh, how you can go be, beyond finite elements and how you do it fast. Because for applications like autonomy, you have to do it fast and how you can assimilate data fast and so on. So we found that depot net with pre-training, hugely over-parameterized network could, could, um, uh, could generalize well. So, so my, 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 you know, we, we, I give you my own take on it. I'm writing a paper now. I, I was just invited by Nature to write a paper on physics-informed learning. Um, and I, I'm sort of asking the same question that you ask because I don't want to mislead people. What is really the best way? And, and, but I think we are sort of at the um, first stages of this. I, I believe um, it's a good area to follow. What's the best way of pre-trained networks and so on? It depends on the application for autonomy. Uh, as you know, there's a huge problem right now in autonomy. Uh, Mercedes-Benz and, and BMW they just dropped their alliance because and, and Uber, they said, now can, they cannot do it. They cannot do it because they cannot just do data driven. So, so some physics is needed. And so how you incorporate that there fast is a big question. Uh, I think DeepoNet is a way to go. I think people can design better DeepoNets. Um, but I believe, I gave this talk uh, about 10 days ago to uh, MIT, the neuroscience department. And they told me that DeepoNet has some characteristic with the feedback of how the real brain works. So I would say something like, a real brain, which takes a very little energy to produce good results, but also the ability to speed up things quickly, so quickly, something like that would prevail also for physical applications. Uh, I, I'm not a prophet, uh, so I cannot really tell you more than that. But um, as I said, I, some of my thoughts will be in this uh, nature paper on physics informed learning. Um, other, other teams like the UW team and others have different approaches, complementary approaches in some sense. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I cannot be more and more precise profit. <laughs> okay, so we have another question coming from uh, Thomas Torku. Um, Thomas, I've asked you to unmute. Thank you. Um, it was such a great talk. My question is just um, regarding deep ONET, does it, um, solve the drawback of PINN? Right, so th this is a good question because I, I forgot to talk about this. So, so um, DeepoNet um, will learn very well from this, if, if, especially if you approximate well the, sp the input space V, the, the better you approximate that space, the, 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 the more accurate you can extrapolate. To interpolate, I show you results 10 to the minus five, right? Uh, different unseen data. But the big question is, can you go outside the distribution? Can, can you go outside the, the space V? And this is actually what we are addressing now. And, and we found that the better you approximate in the nature paper we have, I have many different ways of approximating the space just to make the point. But the better you approximate that space V, the more accurate is also your extrapolation outside that space. For example, we did Mach number eight to 10, what happens at Mach number 13? It turns out that if you, if you uh, take more trajectories between eight and Mach number eight and 10, then you come like within 10% at Mach number 13. And then if you have a couple of measurements, you really nail it. So, 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 so depot net um, is different than that pin. However, if you don't have new data, what happens? Depot net will, will, will facilitate transfer learning. So with depot net, you start initially and then use pins for only 10 or 100 iterations instead of a million iterations. And, and within 0.1 second or within a second, you can also predict. So one possibility is to use depot net plus new data when you extrapolate, which is a big question, or use depot net plus pin, but very short time. In other words, encode the physics now, if you know it to the degree you know it, but very short time. So that, so I think, and, and I think going back to the question that the previous question, perhaps this hybrid approaches may be more successful and more effective in, in, in real, in real uh, life applications, yeah. So I think Jordan has a, a question or two coming from uh, YouTube. And I think to be mindful of Dr. Karnadakis's time, maybe we'll make this the last question. Uh, we, we know that he is a very busy man and I'm sure that- I, I don't mind taking uh, those two questions. Uh, Jason, I, I okay. can take Let, the, the, those questions, no, no problem. 
Okay, let's take the YouTube questions then. Jordan, if you would like to uh, take over. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. So I've got three questions from YouTube so far. Sure. So uh, first is how would this would be applied for anomaly detection where equations do not exist for the variables being measured? Great question. <laughs> well, uh, I, haven't, I haven't answered that question, but uh, one of my collaborators at MIT, Themis Sapsis, who is uh, really interested in this dynamics and so on, he is uh, looking at that now. And uh, I, um, he wrote a proposal, DeepoNet, which probably will be funded exactly on this topic. And so he, they're using active learning on the output. So this, it turns out that the trunk space is very, very important. It becomes much more important when you deal with rare events. So you can use active learning and, and detect and, and important sampling and other really smart techniques um, to, to build those into uh, acquisition function uh, and, then, uh, and then sample of, uh, very selectively to, to affect the input. So it's a, it's a, it's a really smart idea. It's, it's the only way to, to do it, uh, but, uh, but people are working on it. Cool, thank you. Um, and another one is uh, industrial applications of these solvers. Do you, do you see pin solvers like DeepXDE having the capability to replace uh, commercial CFD solvers? Yeah, very, very good question. In fact, if you listen to the supercomputing conference talk by James uh, uh, Huang, the CEO, uh, he was talking about pins for 15 minutes because <laughs> in, in, in his talk, because he used his GPU, he said, to to, and, and pins to design the new GPU. It's, 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 it's a fascinating. I didn't know that. One of my postdocs worked with them, Marja Raisi, and they used it to design the new power electronics and GPUs. And that's why that motivated them to produce this code that's called SimNet NVIDIA. I think I, I, I share that. That's a, that's a parallel pin code that is used now exclusively by NVIDIA and other companies like, um, I, I'm not going to, advertise the companies, they're basically trying to adopt this. Um, so so it's, it, it is really good because it used as a surrogate, um, of course. And, and uh, uh, so, so yes, the industry, as I, I point out that I am targeting actually industrial applications. I'm talking to many, many different companies and, uh, and I kind of like favor the um, companies like LaVision when they give me exotic data uh, and, and, and other companies, but, uh, but power electronics, heat transfer, um, it'll pose problems where you're trying to find the hotspots, for example, uh, on a GPU or, or, or a system like that. And current solvers have to assume what's the temperature or the boundary condition on the hot, sub, on the hot, hot object in order to determine where. So it's, it's an ill pose, the heat transfer problem is an ill pose problem. This one, if you have some measurements anywhere, you can infer the boundary conditions because we can solve without boundary conditions. And, and also fi find the hotspots. So, so it does solve a lot of a series of problems, which that's why people are kind of uh, f flocking into this type of approach. And the last one, Hi. last question. Yes, thank you. Um, the last question is about uh, SDEs. Um, can you, uh, I guess, address uh, problems governed by SDEs? Ah, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know who asked, the, uh, who asked the question, but they can join my, my uh, meeting tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We'll talk about it. So in, um, I, I show you how you can use pins uh, and guns to, to solve stochastic uh, uh, PDEs. Now, this, PD, this, this stochasticity, uh, is, is, is the noise is color. Uh, so if it's, if it's correlated noise, I know how to do it. In fact, in DepotNet, we have two examples. Two of the 16 applications are, are from a stochastic ODE, but with color uh, noise, and also a PD with, with uh, color noise. If we have white noise, we haven't figured out yet how, exactly how to do it. Some sort of a gun version, I would think, would work, uh, but, uh, but it's, an, it's, an, it's kind of an open issue. We also have something that we, uh, um, uh, we just put on the archive like a month ago. It's called uh, generative ensemble regression, GER. And this is um, for unpaired data to discover stochastic ODEs. Um, but but, I, but it, it is a, that's a really good area. And I think that's an area where uh, neural networks eventually will have the biggest impact uh, by tackling the high dimensionality. So for those PhD students out there, 
I would encourage them uh, to, to, to work on in that area. I think it's a great area. I, I put a lot of effort myself. So that's why on Saturday mornings, we form this ad hoc group, we talk about it. But, uh, but yes, it's a great area. We have done some work learning in, in the model space using also dynamic uh, decomposition, uh, by orthogonal decomposition and so on. But, but it's, these are fixes, not real, real methods. So I, I think it's a, the field is very, it's still very open. I think, uh, I think we're done. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there are, there are two outstanding questions on the, the Zoom meeting here, but if you- uh... I can take them, okay, I can take them. Okay, <laughs> you should be careful. This might be a slippery slope. You might be here all day. No, no, just the last two. Because I, ha okay. I have my own crunch meeting and I have, I, we're hosting a, a speaker, so. so. Um, Patrick, Patrick K, I'm asking you to, to unmute. Um... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Amazing. Um, so, hello, thank you for the talk. I enjoyed it. Um, going back to your example between um, function value data, you're trying to learn an operator between function value data, you had this particular parameterization on model space. Um, given the context of all of this talk, of course, I was wondering if you considered parameterizing this operator as a neural differential equation, which just sort of feels like a sensible prior to be using. Yes, yes, you could, sure. No, that's just one way of, of, of doing things. There's, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, uh, what did you find? Uh, no, I haven't done it. I said uh, you could do it. I, we thought oh, about okay. It. We haven't done it. Yeah. Oh, we, okay. We thought about it. I'm, I'm sure. That, I'm sure that that uh, that can be done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And the last one uh, is is Dennis uh, Dennis B. So Dennis. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting, especially for this theorem for nonlinear operators. So. As I understood in this approach, we have uh, so we are using physics when we build in PDF and we add the result to the loss. And from other points, there are some activities when uh, people try to incorporate some physics, I mean, symmetries inside neural network. Yeah, sure. And maybe you're familiar with the work with symmetry on spheres and others. Yeah, so, sure. and in our approach, we try, for instance, learn some symmetry is adding terms to loss and it was not so efficient as we change our uh, our transformation in such a way that it was equivalent with respect to the symmetry so how, can you somehow compare these approaches and have you tried to incorporate physical equation into a neural network so the equivariate approach i i uh, there's a different ways of doing it i don't know i i i'm familiar with one of my collaborators uh, Greg Valiant from Stanford, who has a really nice mathematical way of, of, um, um, of in incorporating, let's say, azimuthal symmetries and so on into, uh, and I'm also the, uh, familiar with the work of Codor from the University of Chicago. Uh, so you have to build a special architecture and so on, but, but uh, we haven't done that in my work. I am including that part uh, of, uh, uh, of how you modify the, uh, uh, how physics could modify the uh, the um, neural network architecture. I include that in in my um, uh, in my review paper. So if if you have anything that uh, that you've done and published, I'll, I'll be happy to include it. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions for today. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karnadakis, and thank you for being so generous with your time at the end here. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thank you, all good friends, uh, Nathan and Stephen and everyone. Uh, uh, this is a great series. I'm gonna, there's a conflict, but I'm gonna uh, follow the recorded uh, talk. So, so, so have fun, uh, have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you.